<laughs> okay, so we're recording again uh, after an internet snafu, and Johanna patiently was waiting while I restored my connection, so let me get back. Uh, this will be part two of, of, this, of this program, so let's see here. All right, now I, I don't know if trying to show that video had anything to do with it. So anyways, this video just shows how embarrassing things can be. Um, let's see, I'm getting a, is, is your speaker turned up loudly there, Joanne? I, I'm getting a yeah, echo. Yeah, it is, okay. yeah. All right, let's see. Okay. So, so one of the things that, that's always perplexed me, and I've been in this business is, so long, why do we make fun of people who don't drink the wine we think is best? Uh, and, and frankly, I'm on a mission to end that. I, it's ridiculous. There's no, no other industry that mocks and belittles and makes more fun of their consumers. Uh, the French always love sweet wines. You could get a glass of red wine, put a cube of sugar in it. You could make a kir. The national drink of Spain was sangria, not Tempranillo or Rioja. And in Europe, wine was always simple. And now that it's become more complex, there's many other factors, but, but consumption in France, Italy, and Spain has plummeted. It's a crisis. And they rely on export because their own people now, France is not a nation of wine drinkers. Uh, and, and that's rapidly happening in Spain, and it's also happening in Italy. As new generations come on, that we become further and further disconnected. Mm -hmm. Equally, I'm as passionate about, nothing's wrong with Robert Parker. His system is fantastic. He's just an outstanding human being. He's got an incredible amount of integrity, and he found a way to communicate that for a lot of people resonated and worked. What's wrong with that? And, and so the wine industry has become like a, a bunch of old ladies in the park, criticizing, stop it. We gotta stop it, okay? If you're running a business, here's what you wanna do. You wanna create and value and retain customers. Creating value is, is building that awareness, that perception that, wow, and whether it's, it's a $1,000 bottle of wine or a, a, a $10 bottle of wine, there is value at all those different levels. And there's quality at all those different levels, but the quality and value is the result of the perception of the market not just because you say it so or read it in a book or because you know a lot of words to describe things does that really create value for the customer so there's this world of people who drink wine and who might drink wine that needs to be broken down by country by age by uh, uh, finances by all sorts of different geographic and uh, physiological and uh, monetary things. And this is called market segmentation. If, if you're trying to build a marketing plan for millennials and think there's one representation of who they are, you're not going to do very much because you haven't targeted your customers. You haven't segmented it. So millennials who are, at, there, there's kind of a wide gap and I've, I've got a, a young millennial son and an older millennial son. And they're night and day different uh, in many ways, but they're totally different market opportunities. So you've got to be able to, to, to narrow things in and then differentiate your product to them in real terms, not just some descriptive fantasy or uh, you've got to tell stories. But, but be aware the story you're telling might be the story everybody else is telling. So are, is the story itself, this is not, don't stop telling stories, but really think through it. Are you saying anything different? And at the end of it, what are you doing to position yourself in the mind of the consumer? So that's, that's the end game. 
And so this is, this is the way it looks in, in marketing books. Divide the market into smaller segments, then target those and figure out where you are and aren't going to do business, then differentiate and then position your product. Make sense? Absolutely. I have a two-year-old snoring in the background here, so that's why I'm muting. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's bad. I'm a grandfather just uh, as of July, so I get to oh, really? my, yeah. my granddaughter in November. Oh, congratulations. Thanks. So here's, here's, here's my mission. Creating a consumer-focused wine culture that understands, not judges, not belittles, not that makes fun of, but understands the market. That we embrace it. Oh, you love this style of wine. I love you too. Come buy wine from me. And this is why having things like uh, in your wine shop, Johanna, uh, having, having all these wines, but also maybe having a, a wonderful raspberry syrup that that people can also add if they like a little sweetness. You don't sell just one kind of wine, you're gonna have 50 wines. So make sure that, that you cover a whole range of different tastes, uh, or different tastes. Actually, if you want to go ahead and mute, Johanna, I'm gonna go ahead and mute you now, because I'm getting that, that feedback. And when you understand and then when you embrace now you can cultivate oh you like these kind of wines oh you want a thousand dollar bottle of wine well let me talk to you i'd love to talk to you i'd love to be have you my customer forever oh that's great so you don't want wine education you want you want something that that makes you look smart let me help you with that oh you just are looking for an everyday wine and a certain pro product or price point. Let me help you with that. Okay. It's a whole different way. And, and Johanna, what I, I want you to think about is who's the wine industry going to be for your two-year-old daughter when she grows up. Okay. And she may or may not have an interest in wine, but, but my vision of, of the future is a wine industry that engages in what we call a new conversation. This isn't a judgment. This isn't based on, oh, everybody wants to go on an exploration and discovery. It's based on, uh, let me listen, let me talk to you a little bit, and let me become your best friend and your guide to get you to the wines you love. And sometimes they want to hear this fancy language and descriptors. They want to see the certification. Sometimes they just don't care, all right? So, so once you've had this new conversation, then here, I've been, we've got a wine for you. That's why we've got all these different wines and, and let's find out which one fits your needs the best. And if you would, it's so important that if you don't like what we're suggesting, come back and tell us, let's, let's, let's keep the conversation going. And that is gold. If, if you can sell a product that misses the mark, that people go, no, I don't think this is it, but then they come back instead of going somewhere else, which is usually the case, you've retained that customer even though you made a mistake in your rec recommendation. And we just don't think that way, okay? More sales, greater retention. So this is a quote from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. <laughs> I'll be referring to this as we go through the program, okay? This is something I live by. So we think that what we see, what we smell, what we taste is what everybody gets. But with, as that cartoon, one person is seeing a six and the other person seeing a nine. They're seeing completely different things. And we really need to get this in the wine industry. Just because I smell jasmine and uh, cloudberries and gooseberries and, and lonyan fruit. Do you know, even know what those are? And if, if you don't smell them, does that mean you're stupid or you're uneducated? No. So we, we've got this idea, and you'll see this in, in, 
in, in blogs and Facebook posts and so on, as if I experienced this, this must be the way it is. Well, we're looking at a much deeper level now, and we call this a phenotype. It comes from the word phenotype. And a phenotype incorporates the genetics of an organism. Sensory genetics mean some people can smell something very strongly and the person next to them doesn't even smell it at all. So a description of that smell doesn't really help or make them understand the wine. It actually just confuses them and makes them feel like something's wrong with me. All right. So genetics determines what you perceive, the stimulations that that then are processed and turned into knowing and understanding and organizing and sorting out the world, okay? So this is sensory genetics. And the second thing, and there's, there's no more important, less important, all right? The second factor is how your brain responds to the stimulation and life experiences and learning and so on. And these have a profound effect on what we like and don't like over time, okay? So this is, this is kind of, we, we've got this total mistake, oh, your palate matures over time. No, it, it really doesn't, <laughs> it's totally incorrect. So again, that's um, uh, 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 sincere ignorance, being ignorant of the fact that Yes, our palate does change, but it's usually very small. There are many reasons for it. Johanna, you might have noticed when you were pregnant, your, your perception changed, but your palate didn't change. It, it was more neurological things that were response to, to, uh, to being pregnant. So it happens uh, a lot, but your palate doesn't really change, okay? So some, there are so many factors in genetics uh, but it's well known that people have different number of taste buds, but rarely known what the difference is, and it's huge. Some people have less than 500 taste buds. People, other people have more than 11,000. And so something that might be a profound perception and experience for somebody, the other person is totally oblivious to. They don't have those receptors. This does not mean there's a better or a worse. These are just potential market segments so that you can understand, huh, I wonder what this person perceives at what intensity, what do they favor? How can I have that conversation? So there's this, this idea that having more taste buds or people who, who Joh Johanna and I were talking about somebody who grew up with this incredible ability to distinguish smells, how does that translate for somebody who doesn't get all those smells or who didn't have the learning to make those associations? And maybe those associations are just illusions and metaphors anyways. That's where I get in trouble. But it's really well known that there's a variant. It's a cluster of genes called OR6A2 and and there are people that have cilantro um, or coriander as it's called in UK and, and a lot of Europe. And there are people that it's pleasant, it's herbal, wonderful, no problem. There are people who find it bitter, but they can adapt to it. They can learn to like it over time, neurological. And there are people who find it just patently, completely disgusting. It's soapy, it's bitter, it's horrible. And Julia Child, one of the most famous chefs in history, was one of these people. She's not unsophisticated or uneducated. And she would actually say if she found it in her food, she would send the food back or she'd throw it on the floor. So what we're studying is that there's, there's genes that regulate how many taste buds and what their functions are, that they're the hot, burn, and spicy kind of things. Uh, the arguments over alcohol levels where people say, oh, this wine's way too high in alcohol, but other people, it's almost as if they're experiencing it as sweet. And that's actually what's happening. There are three genetic variations for alcohol burn, and some people 
don't get it and alcohol tastes sweet and others get this horrible burning sensation. So all of these things are being studied now and give us the, the ability to understand what we perceive. Then once we've got the stimulation, then, then our brain goes, oh, stimulation and, and something's happening. Is it safe or is it dangerous? So if it's umami or sweet taste, it's safe. If it's bitter or sour or salty, it might be safe to a level, but if it goes above a level, then it, your brain's telling you it's, it's dangerous. And you don't have to learn anything to know that. We come pre-wired with that. Once we've sensed something, cognized it, evaluated it, then we can recognize it. Oh, I tried that before. I stuck my hand in a fire. I know what happens. Take hand out of a fire. Don't grab the hot burning metal. All right. Then that becomes a memory. And then all of this cycle becomes then an expectation. Okay. This is marketing 101. Oh, I see an ad for this new store or for this wine or for this event. Oh, oh, you know what? I don't recognize any of these, but let me read more. Let me go to one. Oh, now I know. Now when I see this event or that store, I recognize it. I recognize these people, these products. Oh, it, was it a good experience or bad experience? Because then you're going to evaluate, is it good or bad, cheap or expensive, sophisticated, not friendly, angry, whatever, okay? So neural gastronomic program is how our brain responds to sensory stimulation. We're all different from this end, and then we're certainly different in these cycles and how we evaluate and learn about things. So if you wanna go onto myvenotype.com, this is a, a, one of my companies, you need to take a little quiz and it'll tell you about your sensory sensitivity by asking questions about how much you love salt, how you take your coffee, how you respond to cilantro, sweet wine, soft towels, and all sorts of things. But fundamentally, we break the, the, the entire wine market down into people who want sweet wines, people who demand lighter, delicate wines, people who kind of love everything, and then those who just want really intense, stronger wines, higher alcohol, more oak, that kind of stuff. So, so, so think about your market, think about who you're selling to, who you're working to appeal to, and, and that all of your potential customers have, have their own level of sensitivity, the effect of their culture on them, what they've learned, and, and how they've grown. So the, the example of your friend, Johanna, that's, that has this wonderful descriptive lexicon and whatever, is so learning from the time she was very, very little, right? And then the experience that people have, and this is what makes us all unique and different. Your ability to understand this in the market, to message, to target different groups of people and speak to them in different ways, can be commensurate with the success of your business. You may only choose to go to a very narrow, narrow path. I only want to make big red wines from these regions of Barolo or, or Napa Valley or you know, wherever, Hunter, Hunter Valley in Australia, and that's fine. But know what you're doing and know what the requirements are to communicate and, and to, um, uh, to work with those people. And you're going to get a copy of this as usual. So we break people down into these. And we also know that there are personality traits that are directly correlated uh, to the sensory world that they live in. And this is, this is uh, uh, something that we, we study uh, very, very carefully. And then we also look at, okay, so if I know you're a, if you love sweet wines, let me give you some, uh, some examples, have you tried some of the wonderful sweet wines that we have? Now this is where your story, and, and Johanna was talking about that their story is, uh, we're trying to deal with family wineries and, and, and the story of the family and that. Don't stop doing that, 
but also do some research and find out how many other companies are doing that. You are not alone. You're not the first to do this, all right? Um, so, so go into uh, Naked Wines uh, out of the UK and see how they're leveraging that also, all right? But uh, also then understand, have some sweet wines, some that are a little bit sweet, some that are very sweet and some in between that now come with this story. So if a consumer comes in and says, well, I'd, you know, I'd like a, a glass of a nice, I'd like a little bit sweeter Riesling, or if they give you an example, awesome. This comes from this family and this wine you will find delicious. Now, we'll get to the food and wine matching later, but also let them know these wines were enjoyed with wild boar and with beef and all these other things historically in Germany, in Italy, wherever the wine sourced from, France or whatever. And don't let wine and food match and get in the way of selling and building trust with that customer. Now you're saying something to them they've never heard before. I can have this with beef. Oh, you betcha. If you love this wine, it's going to be delicious. Now you can cultivate them. Now you can tell them the stories. Next time you say, well, oh, the holidays are coming up. If you want something a little bit special or if you want a sparkling wine, try this one because I know it matches to your taste. It's something called a demi-sec. It's sweet like the wines you love. Okay. So this is relational selling based on understanding the needs of a segment. And maybe it's a couple, maybe, maybe the, the, the guy likes sweet wines and, and, the, and the wife likes, you know, big intense red wines. It happens and vice versa, of course. So don't stereotype and think it's one way or another. Learn to have these conversations. If you get couples that come in and one likes wine this way and the other likes this this way, say, great, why don't we get you some of each, this is called selling, and you can enjoy them depending on who kind of overrides when you're opening the wine or, or open them both and then come buy some more, okay? <laughs> so this is, this is uh, let's see, Johanna, I'm going to unmute you for a second. Let's see. Yes, yeah. What colors do you see? Oh, um, <laughs> blue, green, purple, and orange. There, there is no green. No green, okay. <laughs> you don't believe me, do you? No, not really. <laughs> right, see this blue here? Uh, I, I, at, you know, right at the edge of the purple, there's blue, but it looks still green to me, sorry. <laughs> and, and, these are the identical color. It, there's no change oh, in really? color from here to here. No. <laughs> it's only your brain, and especially you see it along here, it's only your brain inventing that color from the environment. Isn't that cool? Oh, interesting, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's try another one. If I had 100 people in here, I'm going to guess you can see a number in there. And what's that number? Number eight. Some people see a three because they don't see these colors. Oh, the orange, yeah. And some people don't see a three or an eight because they're what's called colorblind. They don't have the receptors. This happens in smell. This happens in taste. And so we... Oh, in smell as well? What's that? It happens a lot in smell as well, oh, as often. It happens the most in smell. Oh, really? Okay. That, that you're smelling something and the person next to you doesn't have that receptor. And this is, this is why our training and our education, all of it today is misguided. And so, well, let's do another one. All right. So are these tables... Uh, the, the length and the width, what's the difference? Well, to the left, it's a, yeah, it's a longer one and then a more square one to the right. So this one's narrow and longer. Yeah, yeah. So I hate to tell you this, but they're identical except for the legs. All right? No. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yep. and go ahead and use your fingers on the screen 
in yeah to measure <laughs> but it's true yeah so you're in but here's here's where it's really important somebody comes into your shop they go to a tasting it's really fun they're having great time and they buy some wine and they get home and the kids are screaming and they were stuck in traffic <laughs> and had a bad day of work and then they're going to bring the wine back and said you know what? it doesn't taste yeah. like it did when we bought it in the store or in the tasting room or when we were on the trip on vacation and whatever yeah that, that's really uh yeah, I, I hear that all the, the contextual drinking, we call it here. It's like, it's the context you bought it in or had it in. It's not the same as when you get home. <laughs> so it makes the wine more sharp, uh, less fruity, less round, and, and it's real to them. Yeah. And so what you could say to them now is that a conversation I, I totally understand how context can do that. And it's, and it's fascinating how this works. I'd be glad to take the wine back, or I would really love to have you try the wine again in when you're in a great mood and you've got nice music on or watching a, a, a movie you enjoy and with somebody you love. And see yeah. if it doesn't change totally. Now, just telling them that, Number one, you give them the option to exchange first. Number two, you get, give them the opportunity to create an environment they'll, they'll enjoy it in. This is a spinning lady. She's not spinning, she's not a lady. It's blobs on a screen in two dimension that your brain thinks is spinning, that looks like a lady. Uh, out of 100 people, uh, about 65% think she's going clockwise. The other 35% think she's going counterclockwise. Some people she will appear to change direction and other people she will never change direction. Hmm. Even when they're exactly looking at the exact same thing at the same time. So our perception is not no matter how great somebody thinks they are, it's all these descriptive, blah, blah, blah. It's all imaginary. It's all a, a processing of information and then learning to associate it with different words and flowers and spices and fruits and all this kind of stuff. Okay. Hmm. So what happens is, unfortunately, wine and food matching is nothing but metaphors that actually inhibit people from drinking wine and in reality actually don't make any sense. If you get a nice delicate cabinet Riesling or a nice Italian Moscato, this is great with, with Italian Moscato. Uh, this is a Blue Nun Liefrau Milch with a Primus Cabernet and it's, you're supposed to have a heavy wine to go with the heavy steak. But if you put the Blue Nun or Moscato or Riesling into a glass, and then you pour some Shiraz, some, some a great vintage Bordeaux, a heavy wine, a Chat Neuf de Pop, a Shiraz, and pour them together, hmm? the red wine actually doesn't weigh as much. It's, it's not as heavy. Oh, okay. But <laughs> we make all this crap up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we think about heavy, full body, uh, could, can yeah. handle meat, uh, yeah, all this exactly. association. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is how our brain has been taught to think, and it's not, none of this is true. On Friday, I'm going to invite everybody to a little demonstration, with, and we'll talk about this on Monday night, the whole wine and food, but this is what you've been taught. Trout is not as big, it goes with uh, fish, as red wine is too heavy. And it would, if poach a delicate piece of, of sole or plice, what's your favorite fish, Johanna? Oh, um, uh, salmon. Salmon? Well, yeah. salmon is red and it's, it's bigger than a trout. So it goes with Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is not as red as uh, Cabernet and it's not as heavy. So you wouldn't want it. And th this is what we do. Actually, salmon and Pinot Noir just suck. It's the salt and lemon. We'll, we'll go through this on Monday, but it's the salt and lemon you put on it. 
but there's no natural affinity whatsoever with salmon and Pinot Noir and all this stuff. We've made it all up. <laughs> no, really? Okay. <laughs> yes. And, I'll, and uh, Monday, I'm going to send you some instructions so you can have some, some things to try to, just to show how, how it's, it's, it's not what we say. And so the I have idea a question, is, a short question. Yeah. I see people now when you're like watching these things and, and you kind of make an effort to, to have, having tried to pair food and wine, that some people, they, have, they drink a half glass of wine, then they eat and they drink nothing while they're eating and then they're drinking the rest of the glass after their meal and some people kind of combine it on the tongue. I mean, that's two, for me, two totally different ways of, but you, of drinking wine with food, but you mean it doesn't matter at all. No, things no. happen and that's what we're gonna talk about Monday. Okay. <laughs> but the things that happen are not what we think and they're really simple. And okay. In any case, if you were in Italy, in Tuscany, and, and you were actually living in Tuscany, what kind of wine would you drink every day? And the people of Tuscany, not today because all the locals have been displaced by rich people, but you would have just vino de Tavola. You're not drinking Chianti, you're not drinking Brunello. Those are export wines. The people are drinking everyday simple wines and they can put sugar in it. They can cut it with a little water. Yeah, water, yeah, sparkling water, yeah. You know, yeah. Sparkling water, make a spritzer, make sangria, make whatever. Mm -hmm. so, so all this history that we think with wine and food, complete crap. It's not, it's not what was happening. So we Thanks. got this idea then that your palate matures. It's not, What's happening is, is we, we think we're becoming superior because our wine knowledge, and it's, and it's more this neural gastronomic programming. It's, it's, yeah, and it's fun, and we love to do it, but it's not your palate. Your palate's not changing, okay? Here's how it, it changes. If in your brain, if I were to show you a couple pictures of Sauvignon Blancs, I can anticipate if I'm with a lot of wine experts, I can give a wine and I can say, everybody in this room for the most part from this specific Sauvignon block is gonna say grassy. Yeah. Some, some styles are more like cat's pea, some are gooseberries, if you even know what a get gooseberry is. <laughs> if you've never had a cat or, or cared about cats, do you really wanna have it smell like cat's pea? Um, but what we do know is when we talk about something being grassy, it elicits a lot of memories for people. And Sauvignon Blanc elicits a lot of memories that might be good or bad. You know, is he working while all the kids are playing or is he saving money for his first car? How did this date go laying in the grass making out in high school? Uh, did he hit the ball while the lawnmower was mowing the grass out on another field or did he strike out and it was the worst day of his life? People with grass allergies, when they get a grassy style Sauvignon Blanc, very often are, ooh, get this away from me. And they're responding to, they've got an allergy for that smell. And this was me in college. I was carrying culinary herbs and the police thought it was another kind of grass. But that's another story. Oh no, that's a joke. So here, here's what to get. People are different. We live in these different sensory worlds. And not only that, that's in just what we per perceive as stimulation and, and cognition. How we, how we process information, your life experiences, your culture and environment, your learning and observation. If you can start to have more conversations with customers if you can put that in your marketing material, if you can let them know everybody's welcome, we want, to, we, want, we want your trust, we want your business, we want to be the best experience you've ever had with wine, whether you're a winery, whether you're a distributor, whether you're this or that, you have an advantage over everybody else in the market, okay? So we look at the market in these sensitivities, but then also remembering that all you need is a trip to an area and, and a great experience. Now your brain's remembering the memory. 
But in general, people who love sweet wines, there's a world of stuff to, to select and to offer them. People who like delicate, dry red wines and white wines, a world of wines. And certainly, we're overloaded in the world with really intense, strong wines. Now, in China, as an example, everybody's culturally thinking red wine, and, and it's a long story I, I won't go into now, but Everybody, ask anybody in China, I like red wine, I like red wine. And the fact is, they don't. <laughs> they really don't. They drink it for prestige. They drink it because that's what they've been told they should like. And most of the Chinese tend to like the more delicate wines, and a lot of them like the sweet wines. So to kind of wrap this up, what we're saying is, if you go into a shoe store, you have a conversation with the shoe salesman. One of the things they want to know is about your genetics. What size is your foot? And if you went into a shoe store and they say, oh, try this shoe on because I liked it or it won an award, I'm a master of shoes. And you go, ow, that hurts my foot. In the wine industry, we say, oh, your palate's not mature. You need to take wine classes. You don't know what you like. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous. Could you imagine that happening with a pair of shoes? Ow, oh, this hurts. Oh, <laughs> your foot's not mature. You know, you need to take shoe classes. It's, it's just kind of ridiculous. So, so marketing should be identifying these segments, then custom fitting what you're trying to sell. But if you only make one size, then you've got to find all the people that that shoe's going to fit. That's all. So it allows for anything. It allows to, you know, market a broad number of products or, or be highly specific and, and specialized. You get to choose. But at the end of the day, hi, can I help find a wine you'll love? Trust me, I'm, this is about you and I'm here to listen, to understand you, to embrace you. Thanks for being a customer and I want to keep you forever and suck money out of your wallet and, and uh, make my business really good. All right. <laughs> That's our I think, for I today. Think what scares me here is that I think it's, it's very important to have not only a web shop then, but just to really have these tasting events uh, to get to know your customers and work up a, a, you know, a loyal customer base. Exactly. And when you do it, don't make them have ones that are for people who, who just don't care about all the doodads. And, and whatever, and it's an exploration. You start with the Moscato, have a dry Riesling, a Pinot Grigio, a Chardonnay, then a Pinot Noir, a nice red blend, then a Bordeaux or a Cabernet or, or a Rhone wine. And say, this, we're, we're exploring, what area do you like best? Some will say, I love them all. Some will like, mm -hmm. say, I only like these. Some will say, I want these. And you can actually say the sweet wine. Do you know anybody who really loves sweet wine and only sweet wine, Johanna? Yes. Okay. Go tell them that you just learned that they have the most taste buds and they actually live in the highest realm of perception. Ah, they'll be glad to hear that. They will. <laughs> or she will. <laughs> and, when, and when you tell that to a customer that's sort of timid and this and they, they go, really? You own them for life. <laughs> So Good here's point. what I can tell you about your friend. She very, very probably cuts tags out of her clothes because they irritate her skin. Uh, if she drinks coffee, she probably has to have milk and some sugar in it, or maybe sure. even is a tea drinker. Oh, coffee with lots of things, that's true. She, uh, she's very likely to have pets, and especially what we call rescue pets that you get, you know, that have been abandoned and that kind of thing. And there's all, there's all these things that we know about people that we can say, hey, and when you do this, they go, wow, thank you. Yeah, but we also know that they get very uncomfortable in like yeah, at dinners and things because they have to, when they ask for sweeter wines, so when they don't like, you know, dry Riesling, they, 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 yeah. they come in trouble all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so tell her if she has permission, if that ever happens, to tell whoever it is, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, Good. And that, and that, that, that's what's happening here, and and uh, and that's the highest form of sincere ignorance 
and stupidity in the wine industry is being that way to your friend instead of saying, wow, I, oh, I get it. You live in this sensory world and you love that. And wine and food pairing does not work for her. <laughs> No, I can tell you what works. Braschetto from Piemonte works all the time. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and then, and she probably would love, you know, a nice uh, Moscato d'Asti. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, there are lots of German wines, but she's real so sensitive to sulfites and stuff. So she's really picky, picky, picky. And, and if, you, if you ever go shopping for sheets and pillowcases with her, she's a pain in the neck. She's got to touch everything. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> All right, great. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll pick this up again on Monday and then look at how this applies in wine and food pairing. Okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. Thanks so much for being on the call. It made it a lot more fun, and we'll talk soon. Talk soon. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.